have the opportunity to share some very exciting observations. We um, have, I've been in the business of doing proof of principle clinical research with uh, human uh, biopsies for some time now and in an arrangement uh, to test the efficacy of this product for connective tissue attachment, we set up a plan. The likelihood of a true attachment, a mechanical attachment of connective tissue to an implant surface, to a titanium surface, was unlikely. All reports, beginning with Liskarton's publications in the 1980s, demonstrated that the connective tissue fibers would be parallel to the implant surface rather than be vertically uh, inserted. And of course, if we were to try to emulate a natural tooth, we'd be looking for an oblique attachment. When we look at the product, the collar is, is divided and has two laser uh, cuts at different uh, dimensions, one being 12 microns to encourage uh, osteoblasts or bone connection. And above it, there's a, a lesser cut of eight microns that looks something like this. The theory is that bone would attach at this level and connect it, we'd have a true connective tissue attachment at this level and there would still be room for a junctional epithelium. It sounds like a great story, but the question is, can you demonstrate the efficacy of this hypothesis? Here you see the red line, the arrow, depicts the difference. We can see the difference in structure of bone and soft tissue, and again, we're talking about 12 and, and 8 mi microns. This is a close-up of the surface with no treatment, and then after six months when the uh, cases were harvested and histology using an electron, uh, a scanning electron mic microscopy, uh, this shows in a colored form the connective tissue attaching to these tracks. We'll have several opportunities at different powers to ex examine this so that it will not escape your uh, imagination but as we move, before we move into that, I'd like to uh, make a, a statement relative to the value of having a connective tissue attachment. And I think for this, we have to turn to what we know ab about teeth. Now, with dental implants, the story would be terrific if every time we placed an implant, the bone was flat. But for those of you with significant clinical experience, I would ask you, when was the last time you discovered the bone to be flat? So the difficulty is if you're going to uh, draw a dividing line in the ground and you're going to say, well, th I want bone to here and I want soft tissue to here, how are we going to manage this when we find the clinical reality of bone at different levels on the buccal and lingual or mesior distal or what we see, what I will see a little bit later this afternoon and uh, what we all experienced on Monday and Tuesday of this week before you traveled. So in reality, we're going to have to see how does this function when we're going to have a little bit of soft tissue connection here and then we'll have, what, what will happen here? And I think from a reality point of view, we're going to see that we can get soft tissue attachment in either one of these, eight, both the 8 and 12 micron uh, cut. If you place this margin subcrestal, then you're first going to have to lose bone in order to have it exposed for soft tissue attachment. I think what we're looking for is the antithesis of this. We're looking for how to protect all of the bone. The basic tenet of implant placement is that the implant must reside in the alveolar process. And everything that we can think of from pre preserving the papilla between two central incisor implants to the management of short implants in the ma uh, mandibular or maxillary posterior or wh whatever direction that we have to think about clinically, it would be great if we could preserve all the bone. And from periodontics, what I bring to this conversation is 
if we can have a true connective tissue attachment, then the apical migration of the junctional epithelium will be stopped. And therefore, whatever bone we inherit with the patient will be preserved. And this, I'm going to use the, our periodontal research to show that that actually works and then transfer it to the human histology with the implant. To give you a little bit of an idea, these are different powers. You can see the cuts that you saw before. And all of this is connective tissue growing in and intertwining. These balls are in the laser cuts and these are strands of connective tissue and you can just see that this is unbelievably attached. Now we'll see this, these bigger and in a more orderly fashion as we progress from low power to high power, but I thought just in the beginning I would give you something to think about in terms of there's an obvious physical attachment. So if we're going to preserve the bone, we have to preserve the tissue. This is a two-way street. And when we talk about where we're going with soft tissue, we would like, when we place a dental implant, to have bone come to the top of the threads and stay there. And the way we're going to do that is have a connective tissue attachment right above the bone for the first millimeter, just like it's been described in the biologic width since 1960 with the Gargiulo and publications by Gary Maynard and myself and so many other people. If we can get a connective tissue attachment above this bone, a physical attachment, then we'll stop the apical migration of the epithelium. And we're going to see this with the human histology. Let's look at a couple of examples of how this works. This tooth will be extracted. We'd like to upright this tooth. This is 1974. We have a periodontal ligament and attachment to here, and this is a defect of tooth position rather than inflammation. In moving the tooth, we can see that we moved it too quickly, and it looks like we've created a terrible defect. But you can probe it, which means that the connective tissue is attachment is sound. A monkey study that we performed back about 1971, this is, a, this is uh, the dentin, this is the enamel space, this is the intact epithelium, this is the bone crest undergoing resorption, and what you see here is connective tissue attachment. Now, this is a monkey and this is a human, and you have to extrapolate. But nevertheless, what you're seeing here is that there is a connective tissue attachment. And as long as you have that connective tissue attachment, when you stop the orthodontics, you can see this heel. And here it is 20 years later. I wish that I could tell you this was a successful bone regeneration case. But this is an ex strictly an example of what you can expect. Another example of this is if you take a tooth, this is not from their study, but I have to give them credit for, uh, Walter Cohen certainly made a major mark with this. But uh, this is from the academic repeats of these projects. But what we have here is a tooth and a monkey where the total occlusion is on one molar crown to see what effect you would have from occlusal trauma on the periodontium. But notice, this is the epithelium. The idea was originally in ethology that if you had a very heavy occlusion or occlusal trauma, that you would get stenosis of the vasculature in the gingival corium, and that would lead to so-called death of the tissue in a pocket. And this was, uh, this was proven to be wrong because after the crown was on for six months, the um, animal was subjected to injection of carbon particles into the carotid artery. And the thought was all these vessels would be stenosed. Well, they weren't. They're patent, obviously, because all the carbon particles get here. But even under that type of pressure, the connective tissue attachment prohibits the apical migration of the epithelium. This is the theme that you have to stay with as we translate this from teeth to implants. 
If we're going to manage soft tissues and hard tissues, the first thing is we really have to have a clear understanding of the biologic responses. And for this, we have to look to the tooth. We have to think about the epithelium that we're trying to block because it's the same epithelium on the implant. And we have to appreciate the value of the connective tissue attachment. A lot of this is going to be managing the location of the implant abutment connection. And for this, we have to turn to all the studies from Sweden in the 1990s with the um, inflammatory infiltrate, the connective tissue inflammatory infiltrate, or the micro gap, or all this that we've heard about. There, I'm no exception. I have 20 year old osseointegration cases where we've lost a millimeter or a millimeter and a half to the first thread and they're very stable and we're doing great and this is not a panic. The question always is though, how can we do better? What can we do to enhance our results so that we have fewer problems? We talk about implant failure and really we have very little evidence as to what the etiology is. You know, on one hand you talk about inflammation then you see a patient that hasn't been back in 10 years and there's no loss of bone. We talk about uh, occlusal trauma and I have the first patient that I ever did uh, osteointegration with was an edentulous mandible. She became disenchanted with a prosthodontist and didn't come back to either of us for 19 years. When she returned, she was in a severe temporomandibular joint disorder because all there was was a pink surface on the posterior. She totally had worn away all of the occlusal surface. And even with this severe occlusal disorder, she had not lost one millimeter of bone beyond the first thread anywhere. So I, my point is, the best thing we can do is learn how to, to manage the, the hard and soft tissues and understand what the biologic responses are. And for that, we have to be concerned about where we put the attachment of the abutment and the implant. And <coughs> what the coronal design of this implant is going to be. You know, we're in a position to, s to tell the companies, this is my wish list. This is how I would like an ideal implant design. But have any one of us ever gone to a company and said, this is the ideal, and had anybody pay attention and produce it? And with, as we learn more about this, we're able to do this. Now, we know for years and years that the junctional epithelium is attached with desmos, uh, desmosomal connection to the tooth. It can't be any better with an implant. So it's really not very much protection. The connective tissue, of course, is Sharpie fibers, and we're not going to have Sharpie fibers exactly into an implant because we don't have cementum. We don't have an active uh, biologic substance on the surface. But there is an alternative, and that's what we're interested in this morning. And then, of course, we have the sulcus. Now, this dimension of tissue equals about three millimeters. And as we look at it on a diagram, we have a sulcus. We have the epithelial attachment with the desmosomes and the Sharpie fibers with the connective tissue. What we're interested with the implants this morning is to see what happens right here above the osseous crest, the alveolar process, what happens for the first millimeter? Can we get a physical attachment to deter the apical migration of this epithelium? The other thing to realize, even with implants, is that just because tissue is pink and doesn't bleed, doesn't mean it's healthy. This is a human block of these two teeth that was published by these people in 1984. I'm using it because there is no other information like this available in the dental literature. But here you have a response to deep cleaning where the tissue is pink. But if you put an implant into something like this, where the, you have this degree of inflammation and disorientation of the connective tissue, you have no right to expect that you're going to have any kind of connective tissue attachment to anything. So the first step is to be sure we don't have periodontal disease before we put the implants in place. And this is important. Also, there's a thought that if we open a pocket or we do anything with bone, we're automatically going to lose bone. And even the most recent publications uh, about implants and bone levels talk about, it still describe this. And sometimes this is how we have to treat. And we thought that based on a 1960 application or publication, that we would automatically lose about half of the buccal bone. And therefore, we've begun doing things to try to preserve bone with uh, 
osteoconductive substances that may or may not be necessary. This study was poorly done. It's a classic in periodontics, but I want, none of you are doing your surgery this way today. All the soft tissue was removed. It was a gingivectomy and then a denudation, and then to be sure there was no soft tissue on this dog, these dogs, the bone surface was polished without water. Now, how many of you are treating patients this way in your practice? Nobody. Oh, there is one. Okay. We weren't trying to disprove that exactly, but we took the same protocol and we were trying to see what would happen with piezo surgery. And this was with a carbide burr and a diamond burr and piezo. We, we removed bone as we would do for crown lengthening and we notched the surface. And what we found was that at 28 days, the bone, rather than being lost, we could see new woven bone, which you can distinguish from the old uh, lamellar bone has actually grown up over the notch and to the notch and over the notch. And if we looked at this at 56 days and we look at the piezo, the bone's growing back. So just opening a flap or just drilling into bone does not equal loss of bone. The major thought in my mind in doing an implant is where will I put the shoulder of the implant and what protection am I going to have? And I'm using this material to build a case for what to do with what we're going to see. So I don't believe that just opening a flap results in loss of, of buccal bone. And I don't believe that osteosurgery results in that based on reversing the evidence that we made our judgments on. In performing crown lengthening on monkeys, we found the soft tissues to be approximately three millimeters. And our published interpretation of this was that the space for the new connective tissue fibers, because I want to focus on the connective tissue fibers, would be created by crestal resorption of alveolar bone. The one thing that we don't make clear enough in this, and for the people that just scan read and read the abstracts and conclusions, are that on the buccal surface of the teeth in this monkey, the bone came to the CEJ. This never happens in our patients because we always have to have the connective tissue fiber complex occupy or populate the first millimeter apical to the CEJ. Berglund and Lindy with dogs found about the same thing. We did it with monkeys, they did it uh, with dogs, and you need about three millimeters. That, that seems to be the consensus of the size of the soft tissue attachment. Now, I want to look at a case with you to show that you can take somebody with terrible disease. We have somebody with many missing teeth and very advanced disease. It's 1968. We weren't doing osseointegration. The case was treated and restored. Here's 81. Here's the same case in 2004. It's 36 years later, almost two generations later. And you can see just by where the margins of, of the restorations are, that there's no evidence of continual loss of bone. The margins act as markers. Well, surgery was done to get rid, rid of the periodontal disease first, and then to place the flaps right at the crest of bone and allow the biologic width to develop for each tooth as it sits in its alveolar process. The cases were relined, and the case was finished as this in 1969. Here it is in 1995 with no change other than acrylic is peeling off. This is acrylic and gold, not ceramics. I want to show you this, the stability factor of the soft tissues. We talk about recession around dental implants. I have no idea how many thousands of implants we've placed in our office. We maintain a lot of these patients. And it's not routine to see recession about it around the dental implant, yet every lecture centers on this at some time or another. Here's somebody with advanced disease. The tissue is under control. At this point, it's 1995. At this point, it's 2007. Facings are falling off. The patient's impossible. If I want him to come to the office, he's 90-some years old. I have to send a car to pick him up. I have to do the cleaning for nothing. If I want radiographs, I can't charge. And then when we finish, he tells me how much he hates me for putting him through this experience. But I'm interested in what's happened to the case. 
what I want you to see is you can really stabilize soft tissues. And if you have that connective tissue attachment, you can be pretty sure you're maintaining the bone. I already demonstrated that with the radiographs. The thing that we've lost over the years is the beauty of the case. But he could care less. I, I said, Herb, why don't we redo this? I'll get somebody to do it. Figure, I'll pay for it. I'll get someone to do this for you for nothing. And he tells me how valuable his time is, and he has no time to be bothered with me. 